other norms in shops that I'd love to see, allowing actors to purchase costume pieces because then you know it's going somewhere that someone's going to use it versus if you're going to hang on to it for you know a show that might happen in 10 years. Is that the best use of your storage space when somebody is saying, I would like to buy this thing? Hello, and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Pierre Carlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, which is brought to you by the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be speaking with costume designer and founder of Conscious Costume, Kristen P. O'Hearn. What is Conscious Costume, you may ask? Well, Kristen herself will, of course, tell us all about it, but for now, I'll just say it's an information and resources clearinghouse that Kristen founded in Chicago in 2018. Its vision statement is simple and clear. Every costume created in harmony with people and planet. And it reflects its founder's commitment to sustainability and ecological responsibility, which have been core values for her since childhood. Although Kristen now lives in Pittsburgh, PA, she still has deep roots in Chicago, where she designed for several theaters and also managed a few costume shops in the area. Chicago is also where Conscious Costumes Costumes Rental Facility continues to operate, giving area designers and theaters broad access to reusable materials. It's also in Chicago that during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, Kristen created Artist Resource Mobilization or ARM, an organization that matched out-of-work designers and costume shop artists with mask production opportunities. During the pandemic's most dire year and a half, ARM was able to provide garment artists with $35,000. As you can tell, when Kristen talks about ethics and responsibility in her trade, she really puts her money where her mouth is. Kristen spoke to me from her home in Pittsburgh I started, not surprisingly, by asking her what convinced her to create Conscious Costume back in 2018. So when I was first starting out, I was looking for sustainable costume design resources, and there just weren't any out there. There were things for fashion, but even that was a little thin. So I was looking for these resources and I really built Conscious Costume to be the resource that I wish I had, mainly about spreading the word of the importance, spreading resources, building community. I knew other people were talking about sustainability and were interested in it, but there was no central location to have these conversations. So it started just as a Facebook group. The day of the Tony Awards in 2018 is when I started the Facebook group. So that's what I kind of considered. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I sort of hoped that by starting it, then a lot of people would be talking about theater and active on on Facebook those couple of days. So I was hoping to capture some people that way. And that that did kind of work. So really just started as a place to have conversations and and share ideas. Uh, it wasn't until a couple of years in that I got an Instagram and, and a page and um, that we started working with the Apparel Industry Board, who is our parent organization as a, as a nonprofit, uh, and really trying to turn this into more than just a community but the community is also really active. Um, And I've learned a lot of things about how broad the sustainable and ethical design community and world is. And I've learned so much from others in the group. A costume design professor out of, I think, North Carolina, Rachel Pollock, talks a lot about water conservation in the costume dye process and how she saves hundreds of gallons of water, especially in, in a drought in her region. And so much more that I've learned from the community. It's been fully active for, what, six years now? Yeah, about six years. Tell me about what impact you think it's had so far. What are you hearing from your colleagues who've who've used it as a resource? I think everyone is glad to have somewhere to commiserate, <laughs> if, if nothing else, just share uh, frustrations at the limitations that that we all have to deal with. I think it, you know, a community is is good in so many ways. I have heard from people who have learned things from the community. Uh, I have another designer who does a lot of work with natural dye, and she contributed to a couple of blog posts on our website. So I think the community is the main thing. Now, we also started a costume rentals, or what I like to call rentals and recycling, in Chicago while I was there. 
and people really appreciate the resource. You know, we keep our pricing uh, intentionally low so that it's really accessible for people. We try to make it so there's fewer hoops to jump through. Because oh, so, of- so there was a business connected to it then. Yes. Yes. And so you kind of had, did you have a brick and mortar space? Clearly you must've had some storage. Yep. Yep. So we share a space with our parent organization, AIBI, and that's still there. Um, When I left Chicago, we hired a rentals manager, uh, Emma, who's doing a beautiful job maintaining the space, uh, working with the Chicago Green Theater Alliance on costume swaps once a year. uh, And she's, she's doing so, so much. Uh, What's What's a costume swap? It's where theaters and designers come together, bring costumes they don't want anymore, and take costumes that they do want. That's brilliant. How long has that been going on? Oh, I mean, we've been doing it with them since about 2020 or 2021. I don't remember when the first one post-pandemic was. Uh, CGTA has been doing them for, I think, 10 years, 12 years. They've been doing them for a while. So at this point, you must know so much about the way fabrics are created. What what do you want to share with us about the clothes we wear and ways in which, other than buying secondhand, of course, the ways in which we could be more sustainably minded in uh, choosing our clothing? It's 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 so broad. It's mm-hmm. so broad. Um, but there must have been something you learned that you didn't know before. In, in yeah, ways. yeah, absolutely. I would say look into the labor practices of where you're purchasing from. Make sure that you know people are being paid a, a fair wage at a minimum, a living wage, or a thriving wage would be even better. And um, how do you? Because there's a lot of layers to. F- finding that out for real. Mm-hmm. How, how do you do that kind of research? I usually start with a brand that I know is ethical. And there's places that you can find those brands. One of them is uh, called Good On You. Another is the Cle- Clean Clothes Campaign. And these are all listed on Conscious Costumes resource page so that people do know where to start finding the, some of those things. I am also putting together a sourcing list. I've had one that I've been keeping for about 10 years that I just, when I happen to find a resource that I think might be useful to other people, uh, I put it on this list. And that's also on Conscious Costumes resources page. So that's a place to start. I think organic materials, recycled materials are great. Buying natural fibers is going to be better than any synthetic fibers like polyester or nylon because those are plastic. And I think a lot of people in the last year or two have become more familiar with the problem with microplastics. Well, there's also microfibers coming off of your clothes every time you wash them. And if they are a polyester, then that's going into our waterways and that's not going to break down. You know, that's some of the stuff that the fish eat and then we eat the fish. And then that is how microplastics get into our our blood. It's, it's amazing how much that circle sort of comes back and impacts us. So I would say I try to exclusively buy natural fibers. I also feel more, more comfortable in them because I'm not wearing plastic. And I've, I've just noticed a, a change in how I feel in those fibers. If you do have a lot of polyester, you know, leggings are a pretty common item that's polyester, athletic wear for, uh, you know. All right, because it's got that, that spandex, that stretch factor. Exactly. So if you do have a lot of those clothes, you can get filters for your washing machine, either like a bag that you put the polyester clothes in or something that you attach to your washing machine that will filter out those microfibers to a high degree so that you can just throw them away and then they will go into landfill, but they don't go into waterways. They don't go into your waters. Exactly. I have no idea. Thank yeah. So that. I think that's something that normal people can do. I think that the bag that I have was like 40 or $50, but I've had it for five years now and it's showing pretty much no signs of wear. But I think that that's something that costume shops can do as well is get a get a filter for their washing machine. And that's a huge step to eliminating sure. a sustainability problem. Sure. Because in a, certainly a large theater, the costume shop does tons of laundry. Mm-hmm. daily. Uh, well, since you brought up a costume shop, what would an environmentally, we talked about your work as a designer being more ethical and uh, environmentally conscious. Could you describe an environmentally responsible costume shop? You mentioned that there's limited space, so that's already one challenge. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I just mentioned the microfiber filter to the washing machine. So uh, two years ago, we did a blog post called A Costume Professional's Guide to Plastic Free July. So this is a huge month. Plastic Free July is sort of a social media push to educate on plastics every year. And so we're trying to make that accessible to costume designers. So the microfiber filter links to a couple options are available in that blog post. But other norms a textile recycling plan, be it for the clothes you're getting rid of or your fabric scraps. Unfortunately, thrift stores, which a lot of people rely on to get rid of the things that they don't want, only resell about 10 to 20% of what they receive. And the rest goes to rag makers or ship to the global south where the piles of unwanted clothes are now visible from space. So really coming up with a thoughtful textile recycling plan. Other norms in shops that I'd love to see, allowing actors to purchase costume pieces because then you know it's going somewhere that someone's going to use it <laughs> versus if you're going to hang on to it for you know a show that might happen in 10 years. Is that the best use of your storage mm. space when somebody is saying, I would like to buy this thing? And I will actually use it. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's it, This has become something that is a memory of the show. And I know you know these pants were tailored to me and they fit me and I, I want them. Um, I think is a great way to keep things out of your stock and keep them in use. I think being creative about mock-up materials, you know, the, the industry norm is to buy this clean cotton muslin for every mock-up, and maybe you could buy secondhand dead stock fabrics, thrifted bed sheets, et cetera. And it's maybe not going to be a fit for everything, but every little bit helps is, is my perspective. We kind of already talked about natural fibers, and I think being more conscious about those materials that go into garments that are unrelated to design choices. So cotton undershirts, which pretty much the whole cast will wear. Uh, can you source an organic cotton? Can you search an eth uh, source an ethically manufactured undershirt? Can you maintain them for a longer time through your practices rather than, you know, well, this was worn for one show and now it's it's garbage. At the end of the life, could you cut the undershirts up into rags for cleaning to cut down on paper towel use, et cetera? We sort of talked about polyester. That's another one is really eliminating polyester anywhere you can look. Minimizing dry cleaning. Perk chemicals that go into dry cleaning are really damaging to the environment. They're damaging to the workers of the dry cleaners. They're bad for the actors who wear them only hours after being cleaned, like that off-gassing uh, contains volatile organic compounds that can be really bad for for people. So really minimizing that dry cleaning or finding a green dry cleaner. There's there's ones that have alternative processes now. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of places advertise that they're green dry cleaners, so they don't really talk about, but if they don't talk about what is greener in their <laughs> process, then I assume it's just greenwashing and I ignore it. And that kind of goes back to the question you asked about how to find a brand is if you go, are on a brand's website and you look for their sustainability page, if they don't have one or they don't say anything specifically, they just use buzzwords like natural or clean, those words are meaningless unless they say more specifically what they're doing it's like yes it's like in the in the, in the supermarkets with products that use natural it's meaningless mm -hmm. and and i compare clothes shopping to food shopping a lot because you have to think a lot about a lot of the same things you know uh, a lot of times organic produce or organic cotton they don't use chemicals they don't use the pesticides but they tend to be more water intensive as a result. So if you are in a really drought prone area, maybe organic is not your best bet. Maybe a low water use is a better, a more sustainable option. Like I said, it's it can be really complicated and there's lots of layers to look at. Turning back to the costume shops and clothing mm -hmm. design, do you ever, because I know you often have to work with really tiny budgets and you're expected to create really like spin magic out of these budgets. Do you ever face resistance from your directors or producers? Is there is there a downside? Is there a big economic downside to what you're proposing? I think the biggest issue is that it takes more time. And I absolutely encounter resistance, which is more time in because of the sourcing. Hmm. 
Yes. Yeah, generally because of the sourcing. I see. And that resistance and the friction is part of the reason I'm more focused on educating others right now than doing the design myself. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I'm neurodivergent, so I can get really obsessive about the sustainable and ethical choices. And that negatively impacts the shop staff and the production process because oh, I take a really long so time. So you've come to, to realize that. Yes. Yes. Okay. I have realized this about myself. <laughs> um, so uh, right now, education is really what I'm pushing for. I would love to do more work with companies or on productions that are intentionally ethically minded rather than me just kind of tacking that on the side. Uh, because I think if we were all had that mindset, it would be really helpful. I worked on a production recently where we're knowing that I take a little bit more time than the average designer. I asked to see the stock very early in the process. And the shop manager was really resistant to that idea because the show hadn't been cast yet. I wasn't done designing. Why would I need to see the stock? So I think it is asking people to change up the norms and sort of back up their standard production process. But I knew if I saw the stock and had an idea in my head of what I was working with, that might impact the decisions that were I was you able make. to do it, or did you pull back in that instance? I I did decide to pull back okay. on that instance. Um, it was a shop I hadn't worked with before, and I was trying to not ruffle feathers, and that can be that can be really challenging is deciding when to push and when to pull back. We've talked about the ethically conscious part of your your mission being about labor practices, certainly in the production of materials, but does it also include labor practices within the U.S. Theatrical field in the way that designers and costume shops are uh, the labor in those places is managed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, anyone interested in that, I highly recommend looking into the work of Costume Professionals for Wage Equity or on the film side of things, look into Naked Without Us. Both of those are pushing for labor equity and pay equity within costumes. So not only are costume designers typically the lowest paid designers on a production. I can guess why. Can I guess why? <laughs> you can guess why. It's to do with gender. It is to do with gender. It is what we call a pink collar job. And historically, garment workers make less than than our counterparts in other fields. I have seen theaters advertising entry-level like internship jobs in their scene shop and in their costume shop. And the costume shop one will be paid a dollar or two less per hour than the scene shop one. And when challenged about that, they just go, well, this is what we've always done, which is really a sentence I hate. <laughs> But I also think the other reason that I like the word ethical is, is there actually an ethical way to pollute a river? <laughs> like, it is about the people, but it's also about the environment. I think, you know, there's no ethical way to knowingly damage the environment. Are you, going back to design, are you hearing from scenic designers and lighting designers that they too are interested in sustainability in their own fields? Yeah, absolutely. I hear from designers all over the spectrum and technicians, practitioners in, what, in whatever realm that they're interested in this as well. So there's the Chicago Green Theater Alliance, which is made up uh, significantly of designers, technicians, administrators, uh, relatively the people that I know aren't on the performance side of things. There are a lot of the, the offstage things. And reuse is a big part of the conversation when it comes to set and props. When it comes to things like lights, it's about the instruments and reducing how much energy the instruments draw down, lowering the carbon footprint that way, but also sharing equipment instead of buying a, a new piece of equipment for a show. How can, you know, how can I use something that maybe my friend has? Or how can I redistribute this unique item that I bought for a show that I only need for this one show and get it out to somebody else? So the Chicago Green Theater Alliance Facebook group is kind of a huge year round materials swap and equi equipment swap that people are always posting, hey, we strike. Next Sunday, here are the things we're getting rid of. Set up a time to come grab them. That's fantastic. And it really it just cements the community even more. Yeah, absolutely. I've met more people doing that than I think I have on shows, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is great. And I think it's because we all look at something that we spent two months building 
And we don't want it to go into a dumpster. We don't want it to go into a landfill. We don't want it to just get tucked in a corner of stock where it's going to fall off the hanger and get stepped on. You know, We see the value in these items and I think want them to get used. If you had the power to snap your fingers and change the way one status quo system in the theater world uh, regarding costume design and the people who build costumes, what would be at the top of your list? What would you magically change and how? Yeah, so I think it would be kind of the thing I was just talking about, about borrowing or loaning or reselling costumes or other theater items and really focusing on circular thinking. So right now we kind of have linear thinking or a linear economy where something is made, it is used, and then it is disposed of. And circular thinking starts to disrupt that where something is made, it is used, and then it is sort of remade or reshared or goes back into the top of the funnel somehow. So in 2021, uh, my colleague Amy Sutton and I won the San Diego Opera Hack with an idea for an app that would facilitate sharing of theater materials. So they, they thought it was a good idea too. I think this is something that interests a lot of people. I've heard a lot of people talk about. Unfortunately, the It was a sort of token prize money, which was lovely and appreciated, but not enough to develop uh, the technology. Yes. Developing an app is very expensive. For a little while, we were working with the Theater Green Book, which is out of the UK, and the Canadian uh, Canadian Green Alliance, which is another green theater alliance, uh, to find additional sources of funding possibly uh, government grants in the UK or Canada. The US doesn't have government grants for this type of thing, unfortunately. A few months ago, a similar platform came out in the UK called Pursued by Bear. Uh, and I'm in contact with the person who developed that app. And hopefully we're going to be able to connect here in the, the not too distant future because he built something that is really similar to what we were thinking. Uh, it's just only available in the UK right now. So yeah, I would really love for some sort of tool to facilitate that borrowing, reselling, loaning process. Because I think a lot of people would do it. It just comes down to time. So finally, since you're really full-time artist now, what uh, what's next on your artistic plate? Yeah, so I'm really taking 2024 for, for two things. And the first is focusing on conscious costume, specifically on conscious costumes cash flow. I would love for that to be my full-time job. Right now, uh, what would that entail? What does that entail in terms of like in terms our of cash flow? <laughs> in terms of get, getting more cash flow. So right now we have our rentals manager who I mentioned in the space that we're paying for, and that's kind of all our budget is going to. So that's the fees for the rentals. It's some grant support out of Chicago, and we do have a Patreon that gives us a small monthly income. Those are the the three things right now that are making our income. I would love to get more rentals out there. I would love to get more people interested in supporting some of the research I'm doing through the Patreon because I would love to spend more time really focusing on creating new resources, but that has not been a high priority um, because I'm just trying to keep afloat right now. But there's a lot of writing projects or video projects that I I have cooking around the back of my head that I would love to do when I have the time and resources to do them. And then the other thing uh, that I'm focusing on is my personal approach to creativity and design. I've been doing some upcycling projects for clothes that I've had ideas for for a while, uh, creating art with upcycled textiles. Uh, I have a lot of small pieces from mask making with arm. Last year, I had a piece in a gallery show, and I also donated a piece to Planned Parenthood's fundraiser uh, that had a quote from the original Roe v. Wade decision uh, embroidered on it. So that's sort of been my my personal approach to art. I really do want to get back into a, a theater setting. But like I said, I think it's got to be a production where the sustainability is a part of the whole process, not just just my thing, because I will I will shoot myself in the foot and that's not good for my mental health. The other thing that I've been working on this year is I'm working on my permaculture design certificate. So permaculture is really about design and systems thinking in sort of an agriculture setting or in a garden setting. And it has just really fit into the way that I think about the artistic ecosystem and sort of that circularity. There's, there's three ethics in permaculture, 
earth care, people care, and fair share. So it just, it fit into like the ethos that I was thinking about. It kind of felt like I found my my people. There's one of the things I like about costume design is it's sort of a puzzle of sort of how do you make everything work within the design constraints? And permaculture is giving me sort of that same puzzle approach of, you know, limited resources, limited budget, limitations within the sun and the rain here in Pittsburgh and the the space that I have. And so it's just given me a different way to stretch some of those skills. Uh, I'd really love to at some point do a class or an article or a video on how the permaculture ethics and systems thinking can apply to performing arts and entertainment. Yeah. Um, because I really, I think that this ecosystem thinking and this collaborative thinking is the main solution to uh, being able to be more sustainable as an industry. Dear listener, I have happy news. Remember how Kristen mentioned Naked Without Us and the lack of pay equity for designers and costumers? Well, just two weeks after we recorded this interview, IATSE, the Stage Employees Union, announced a new major deal with Hollywood studios and streamers that will guarantee that costume designers will receive pay equity with their design peers. Finally, congratulations to all involved for winning this battle. If you'd like to read a longer version of this interview and see some of Kristen's work, just head to uncsa.edu slash artrestart. All podcast platforms work differently, so wherever you are, please click whatever subscribe, like, notification buttons you can find. And if you have a minute, won't you please leave us a review? I really appreciate it as it helps us reach new listeners. Thank you. You're the best. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Pierre Carlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Keenan Institute for the Arts, thank you for listening. <laughs>